Well, hi there, it's Matthew, and welcome to another episode of Learn From People Who Lived It. Today, we're going to dig into a subject that I honestly didn't know too much about before today's recording. It's the idea around school avoidance. And how is that different from just being late a few times or tardy or maybe your kid just doesn't really want to go to school because there's some underlying thing happening there. Uh, We're going to dive into school avoidance. We'll define it. We'll help you understand what it is and why people usually find themselves going down that road of figuring it out. We're also going to discuss the underlying issues that contribute to it. Plus, and most importantly, we're going to talk about how schools, parents, And educators can work together to solve this issue for the kiddos because that's our ultimate goal, right? To get this right for them, to create an environment where they want to be, where they can grow, where they can learn, where they can do all the things that we hope happen in schools. So sit back for the next hour and enjoy a great conversation around school avoidance with myself, Dr. Frank Bavacqua and Jane Dembski. That podcast is coming right up. First up, let me tell you about a couple of our resource partners. At Metal Joe, they sell more than shirts. They sell apparel with a purpose. In fact, my favorite hoodie in my closet is a Mental Joe hoodie. They help out GI Joes to the average Joes one t-shirt at a time. With every purchase, you help them support organizations that can provide services to help others get out of their heads and into their bodies through plant medicines, equine therapy, yoga, and other non-traditional mental health treatments. Link to them. Pick out your favorite t-shirt or hoodie right now at learnfrompeoplewholivedit.com slash resources. You've probably heard me say this before, but most of the things that kill us are preventable, and that's exactly why I put my heart in his hands, in his care. I'm talking about Dr. Robert Todd Hurst and Health Span MD. He's my cardiologist because I appreciate his holistic approach to heart health. There's nothing out there like Health Span MD. His AFib reversal program, his CAD reversal program. Get the link on the resources page at Learn Learn from people who lived it.com. Find Learn from People Who Lived It wherever you get podcasts. Search it using all one word Learn from People Who Lived It. Welcome to another episode of Learn from People Who Lived It. Hi, I am Jane from New Jersey. Jane, what story are you here to share today? Well, I am here to talk about school avoidance. I have an organization called the School Avoidance Alliance, and we are here to spread awareness about the issue, tell the story of what parents all over the country and really all over the world are experiencing, and how to help your kids and how to work with your school. Okay, so then who do you hope hears this? I'm guessing parents. (laughs) Of course, parents, also school personnel, educators, administrators in schools, because they are really a key part of the equation here for success. Also legislators, um, because there is an intersection between laws and attendance that affect kids and their families. So it's so interesting and welcome everybody to learn from people who lived it. It's it's fascinating to me because just yesterday I got the automated voicemail from my son's school because he missed because he was uh, homesick uh, talking about, hey, your son or daughter missed school. And we, can we please work together to make sure that these types of things don't happen again? And so the timing of this is very interesting to me. I'll introduce first on the top left, Dr. Frank Bavacqua, who is back from paternity leave. How is baby (laughs) Madison? Great. Not quite ready for school yet, but you know, she's, uh, I mean, she's great. She's cute. Um, she's stinky, but, uh, yeah, I'm excited. It's good to be back. Are are you enjoying fatherhood so far or is it, is it, is it stressful? Like what, what, what kind of a new parent are you? Um, well, we were the new parents who we had our kid home for one day and then brought her back to the hospital because she was breathing a little weird and we freaked out. So, <laughs> you know, we uh, we ripped that Band-Aid off right away. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm doing better with diapers than I thought. Uh, she puked in my beard yesterday and I handled that okay. So, I mean, yeah, nothing you throw at me today is going to be harder than what she's thrown at me. That's wonderful. Well, congratulations again on the baby. Jane, I'm sure you've got a couple of kiddos. How old are they? My son is 27 and my daughter is 22. Okay. Um, I want to jump into this conversation today and learn from people who lived it because I think we have a really good opportunity to learn from somebody who has gone through this whole thing of school avoidance. And, you know, I'm guessing as we jump into this that 
school avoidance like it's it's one thing to miss a few days it's one thing to be like mom i don't want to go to school it's a whole other thing when it turns into an episode as you've told us uh on kind of this pre-interview where you know you find yourself in a situation where you're dealing with seven psychologists six psychiatrists no response from antidepressants acute inpatient hospitalization you've been through the ringer when it comes to school avoidance and i think you know we're going to bypass this whole zero to ten question that we normally have because of the fact that we're talking we're not necessarily talking about you we're talking about your son and the things Mm -hmm. that he went through so what is the separation between somebody who is like i don't really like school i don't really want to go to school to that experience of you know seven psychologists six psychiatrists and all the rest that you've had to deal with what was that fine line for you that separated those two yeah there is no fine line <laughs> it's mm. no an line and parents will see that and no- notice it because it is an extreme avoidance fear that often looks like crying hiding under the covers running away it's um it's just really in your face fear and almost to the point where it's like you're asking your child to walk over hot coals it's um wow. and the you know um, I don't feel well today or tomorrow, uh, you know, right now I have a stomach ache. That will usually grow into something more significant. And that's when it's school avoidance. You will see a pattern. You will see days missed. You will see um, calls from the school about the child maybe being behind with work. But more importantly and more obviously, you are going to see the child freaking out at home. Wow. Oh. And I can't even imagine how difficult that is to deal with because as a parent, like we sort of expect it, right? My kids are almost 18, almost 16. Like I remember when they were little and they might have a big test the next day and all of a sudden they had a tummy ache and it was like, well, yeah, buddy, that's, that's, you're just anxious and you know, you're nervous about your test tomorrow and that's okay. Those are healthy things. And and then it gets to a point where in in your story at least you have people just like when you say avoidance of school are we talking about days missed weeks missed months missed like what is what is your version of this yeah i mean it might start out days then it goes to weeks months my son had been out for weeks and months but i know people whose kids have been out for years and my story really is shocking as it is you know uh, when if we get into detail I am not alone in this. I have a parent support group that I do in a private Facebook group, and I speak to parents every day and see what's going on. They are suffering just like I did and sometimes, unfortunately, worse. Mm. Because, um, you know, in America, we do, first of all, have that problem. There's a shortage of mental health professionals. The mental health professionals that handle and are experienced with school avoidance are few and far between. The ones who are, are not in your insurance network. So (laughs) it's the people who have the best resources to get the best doctors. But even them right now, even they right now, are in waiting lists six weeks, six months to get to see a mental health professional. So we do have a mental health crisis in America with our kids, a mental health shortage with providers. And that's why... um, it's even more important for parents to be um, educated on school avoidance and the school districts because we might not have a mental health provider in the picture. So the parent and the school really need to work together. Frank, I don't know if you have a question, but the first thing that I'd like to ask her is, can you define school avoidance for us just so we're clear on what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. So school avoidance is when a child is having trouble staying in, in school for a full day or missing days at a time. And as I mentioned, it might start slow and build like for my son he had a few days missed in like third or fourth grade but then sixth seventh it became very significant and it was that fear factor where just tremendous fear about going to school and say if you were driving the child to school this happens a lot they will not get out of the car they will scream they will hide um so it's really a extreme fear of school making it known vocally, behaviorally, and um, then it will add uh, adding up to a significant amount of time. What kind of student were you, Dr. Frank? Would, were you like always in school? You strike me to be the, like, you were probably a pretty good kid and did, did what you were asked and all the things. So you're calling me a nerd? That's fine. I'm not saying that. I'm <laughs> saying you were reliable to your school. <laughs> um, I feel like I at least as as best as I remember it, I think I I treated school similar to how I treat work now, 
that like if it's if it's there and I'm supposed to be there, I can be there. But like, you know, I grew up in the north. So Jane, you're from New Jersey. I grew up in Connecticut. Like I had I had snow days. Right. My niece just had a snow day yesterday. Um, so, you know, I was never sad about a snow day. Right. I was never I was never sad if school got canceled. Um, but if I was supposed to be there, I think I went. Um, and there were like, there were isolated moments that I can remember, you know, tests or projects or, you know, if, if I wasn't getting along with like a kid at school. So there were like temporary blips where maybe I was a little more hesitant, but they were, they were just that they were temporary, uh, as best as I can remember. Yeah. Interesting. My story, Jane, and the reason that I kind of connected with you and ha wanted to have you on this podcast was in fifth grade. And then again, in seventh and eighth and ninth grade, I experienced bullying in my school. Oh, and with, with regard to my experiences in fifth and sixth grade, it made me not want to go to school. I didn't, I didn't, why would I want to go down to the bus stop just to get my ass kicked by Doug Mueller one more time, right? Like, why would I want to do that? And then why would I want to go to school in seventh and eighth and ninth grade just to get picked on and punched by Craig Beckham one more time? Like it was an absolute nightmare for me. And I'm sure that's one of the ingredient in people who avoid school. Am I wrong? Well, bullying can be a factor. It's not always. You know, I okay. don't have stats on how many, but um, a lot of the parents I speak to, that's not a factor. And I, I wanted to point out a fact um, that Dr. Frank said, well, that you said, you said, you know, were you a good kid just going by the rules and going to school? Well, a most of the kids who have school avoidance are those good kids. I believe They're the it. Kids who are super intelligent and they want to be in school and they want to perform and they're super intelligent, and they just can't because of issues that might be a mental health disorder, social mm -hmm. anxiety, depression, OCD, trauma-related issues, or a learning difference that is not diagnosed. What was your learning difference? I just did not learn the way that other kids did. More visual. I didn't like to sit in my desk. That was torture for me. I mean, uh, I, I always tell people if I'd been coming up in the school system now, I think I'd be a lot different student because I was, you know, in the 70s and 80s when it was sit down and shut up. <laughs> yes, I, I hear you there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just sit down and shut up. Yeah, it's real fair. It works. It works really well. Frank, by the way, when Madison gets a little bit older, sit on and shut up will not be very effective. Just just going to let you know that right now. I'll try anyway. Yeah, we'll see, for sure. We'll see what happens. Jane, I, so, uh, I uh, and you, like I said, you, you talk to a lot of parents. You, you've been exposed to a lot of kids who kind of are struggling with this thing. I imagine you tell me if I'm wrong. There are a portion of students who can articulate kind of a, a specific reason or maybe even a general reason as to why they don't want to go to school that day, like Matthew talking about the bullying, right? There was a very kind of identifiable reason, something that you wanted to avoid. And I imagine there's also a portion of kids who can't quite articulate why they just know they don't want to. You tell me if I'm wrong. That is the majority, the kids who cannot articu articulate it. Unfortunately, that's what I went through and a lot of parents. I'd say most parents go through that. There are very few kids who can, who can identify mm -hmm. why they are comfortable going to school. I don't know mm -hmm. what the differentiator is between what makes those kids be able to pinpoint it and say it, mm -hmm. but that is one of the, like, the biggest problems because mm -hmm. therefore we are left to be super sleuths, detectives, mm -hmm. and we need compassion and um, people to understand the situation to try to help find out what is the cause. There's always a cause, you know, we call yeah. it the problems. Um, but yes, that is part of the biggest problem, one of the problems. So uh, let's subdivide further. Of, of, the, of the kids who are in that group where they're not able to articulate a reason why right now, how many of them actually do have a reason, but they're maybe scared to share the reason or they don't feel comfortable sharing the reason. And how many of them truly just don't know, like they don't have that awareness kind of within themselves to even know. 
I think a lot of them don't have the awareness. Mm -hmm. um, if kids, most kids, if they are having an issue and a trusted adult is asking them and they know what it is, yeah. most kids would say because they're sure. struggling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but most of them really don't. And it's like, how can you not know? Right. <laughs> and, um, right? So my son, um, he, for example, he never was able to tell us what was going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, all throughout the therapists, um, psychiatrists, he was diagnosed with a um, the anxiety disorder first, mm -hmm. then social anxiety, then depression became a part of it, which often happens because mm -hmm. you can't function because of your anxiety, you get depressed. Um, and then we had him tested through the school district. He didn't have a learning difference. Uh, maybe his processing speed was lower uh, compared to his uh, high IQ, which he had, mm -hmm. that might have been causing a weird thing. I mean, my son is 27, and he just still does not really want to talk about it. Mm. Uh, it's a really sore point. And um, I surmise, and he agrees, social anxiety was a part of it. I also feel that he super intelligent kid where everything came easy to him, you know, preschool, kindergarten, elementary school, he didn't have to do any work. It was just like, he understood everything. But then when he had to like, um, maybe write something and start writing, he couldn't figure out how to start or choose something. Mm -hmm. When the options were unlimited and infinity, he could not figure it out. If there was mm -hmm. a yes or no, yeah. But that was a huge problem. And then I found out only through snooping and forgive me <laughs> that through um, some of his hospitalization notes that he mm -hmm. wrote that he remembers a teacher in third grade who picked on him and would send him out of the room really for no reason, just because mm -hmm. she didn't like him. Matt was a good is a good kid. Yeah. So that's the, also the problem. It's it's contributing and co-occurring factors. Mm -hmm. I just mentioned a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was yeah. just thinking the same thing, Frank. And I, if you don't mind, I'd like to pile on to that question right now, because one of the things that you might help us with on this conversation, Jane, is you you had to have as a parent tried everything and anything possible. Some things you got right. Some things were a miss. So right now, are there, are there a few things? Are there two or three things where if you're dealing with a kid who's got this avoidance issue and doesn't want to go to school, what are things you should not do? Please don't do these because <laughs> they contribute to the problem. Do you have a yes. short list of things? Yes. Do not yell at your child. And okay, so no hard. yelling. That is the hardest part. In the morning, you never know what you're going to get when you walk into that kid's bedroom. You're tiptoe with anxiety as a parent. All the parents tell me the same thing. You don't know what you're going to get. And oftentimes people lose their cool, especially at the beginning. And you're like pulling the covers off, yelling, get out of your bed. And oftentimes, if there are two partners in the house, what they might totally disagree. One might be the softy or the more calm. And the other one is like, get that kid out of school. I don't give a S. You yeah. know? So that does not help. The child does not need commotion and anxiety and anger around the issue. So okay. from what I hear from parents and the clinicians say, a sense of calm and support and recognizing their feelings, but always, always expressing that school is very important and that you are going to help them figure this out and they need to get to school. So that's one thing that they okay. should not do. They shouldn't ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't wait. No wait and see. I don't believe in that when people say, oh, it's a phase. Is there really such a thing as a phase? I'm curious what you guys think for kids. Um, yeah, I think kids I believe in phases. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't want to come to this <laughs> because school avoidance is not a phase. You know, if the kid is missing school or staying away or fearful of it, that's for a reason. That just doesn't come out of the blue. And right. if it comes quickly, then you might think that maybe it's bullying because that's a, you know, right, you know, a quick onset or a toxic teacher situation that would make you think that. Yeah. Okay. So we're not yelling. We're expressing how much school is. What else could we do that will be detrimental to the success of this issue? 
well, not detrimental, but it's not going to help you and you're not going to make progress if you don't get educated on school avoidance. Uh, okay. That's why our website exists. That's why our school avoidance masterclass for parents, thank you, masterclass for parents exists because um, there is not a lot of good information out there. When we were going through this years ago, there was nothing. Nothing. I can't even imagine nothing. nothing. Even like, you know, that's 15 years ago, right? It, it was like um, 10 maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I would scour the internet for hours reading, you know, education, disability law, you know, all this stuff and about, you know, mental health, even though I had all these experts, psychologists and psychiatrists. Parents don't often recognize there is something called school avoidance as well. That's a big, big factor. So I have a Facebook group. I did an informal poll of about 50 parents. And I said, how long did it take for someone, a professional, or you to recognize that your child had something called school avoidance? 49 of them did not know what it is out of 50. And then when I asked them how long it took for someone to tell them three months, six months, nine months, a year, or never until they found our website. Hmm. So that's a major problem because it, parents are blindsided about this. They don't know it's an issue. And that's another problem. So everyone feels alone. They feel like they're, they're screwing up, that their kid is messed up. And when they find our website or our Facebook group, they're like, oh my God, they, I swear, they say, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful right. we found you. I thought I was alone. So this, you know, your podcast is showing people they are not alone and it's so easy to feel like that. I felt like that years ago. I would have driven hours to have met a, a family that was going through this and connect with them. So therefore, you know, the Facebook group and our peer support group, that allows people, the parents, this peer support group we have, which is bi-weekly and we get on the phone, the, the Zoom online meeting and they are just so grateful to talk to each other that is helps lift them up through a really difficult process yeah we certainly understand the power of feeling less alone and i, I might even add to your list and i'm not sure you planned on mentioning this but to me and frank we talk about this a lot with some of the other folks that we interview there's almost no value in f this feeling of like i'm doing something wrong there's something wrong with my kid What's wrong with me? What's wrong with them? That that to me would be something that I would add on this list. I'd be like, yeah, don't yell. Don't sit there and blame yourself. Don't sit there and blame your kid. Get educated and trying to figure out a way around this. And Frank, I'm going to ask you to talk about this. And then I'm going to go to you, Jane, and ask for, your, for some follow-up here. But you and I have talked about this a lot, Frank. When that story starts to develop in your head and the tale you're telling yourself is, I'm broken, there's something wrong with me, there's something wrong with my kid, there's something wrong here, mm -hmm. uh, th that's not, that's not going to end well. So speak on that, Frank, about the power of the story in your head and why it's so critical to s settle it down. Well, it's, it's really likely to result in not asking for help, right? So... I think in a lot of cases, blame can lead to shame, right? So if I blame my kid for something that's going on, or I blame myself for something that I'm not doing well enough that has led to this scenario, um, then we kind of start to feel bad about it. And we don't want to let other people into that. We don't want to let people into like, oh, look at, look at what my kid is doing, or look what I've done to create this scenario or whatever. Um, and so I think that it, regardless of what we're talking about, that ends up delaying, you know, the amount of time it takes before you bring somebody else in who can potentially help. I think that's what you're getting at. What do you, how does that, <clears throat> what do you think about that statement? Because I'm sure, unless you're like superwoman, Jane, you had to have had those feelings along the way, like, gosh, what's wrong? What did, did I do something? Did he do something? So how were you able to overcome that story and get on a better path? You know, I never blame myself. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, That's so powerful. I I wondered what was wrong with Matt. And mm -hmm. it, for, it was really, and I felt I was extremely educated on mental health issues. As a child, I had depression and I've seen therapists throughout my life. And I suffered through depression as an adult and been on antidepressants. And I understand everything about therapy. I right. thought... But my son's first showings of 
anxiety. I did not recognize as anxiety because I didn't know until I read about this that kids anxiety shows very differently than adult anxiety. What so did you learn there? What did you learn? There? I'm going to pause you right there. What yeah. did you learn? Well, this is what he was doing that I didn't know was anxiety. Mm. I mentioned he was had to write two sentences every night in like second or third grade about a book he read. This, I, I hate this freaking book club they have in the elementary school. <laughs> it was the bane of my existence. Every kid was sent home every night, had to come up with two sentences about what he read. So Matt would start, you know, he would sit there and he would start crying or screaming and running around the room saying, I know what to do, but I can't. I know what I do have to do, but I can't. And he would run in circles crying. I didn't know that was anxiety. I, I called my aunt, who's a social worker, and I said, what is going on? She said, that's anxiety. I said, mm -hmm. I had no idea. I mean, I didn't sp speak to my aunt that night. I learned a little bit later. <laughs> so it presents very differently. So parents often mistake anxiety um, or, or miss the signs, I think. I, I know that ADHD and anxiety often mimic each other as well, from what I hear from the experts out there. But um, the blame, I didn't blame myself. I, um, I was worried about my child. What the F is wrong? What is going on? I had no idea there was something called school avoidance until like our second year in. And one of the psychiatrists that we found told me that term. I had no idea. Interesting. And that, I'm guessing, changed the game because now you had something to aim for. You had like, okay, I've got a path to go down. Yes, I was very fortunate. And I found this gentleman by accident because the other psychiatrist wasn't available that day. And he <laughs> stepped in and I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's like from the heavens because he got it. I did not like the other doctor. <laughs> and um, I was like, you have to be our, our psychiatrist. And he was very, I was very lucky. Also, he was a very responsive doctor. I was able to text him and he would respond to me, which is not common i don't know if it's changed over the years but to have a, a doctor text you you know i thought that was awesome so his support was was my support and got me through and got my son through this you know helped us let us yeah. guide us i have a question about how important it is to bring the child along for the ride like do you sit Matt down and go, all right, buddy. So it turns out mom found out that what we have here is something called school avoidance. Uh, here's a few things that we know about it. And here's a few things we can try to help you out. Do you sit him down and have that talk? Or do you just start to engage in the sequence that will make sense and get him out of the position he's in? Yeah, I never did. I don't know if I totally missed the boat on that. I just said, okay, you're going to see Dr. Silva. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to see Dr. We're here to support you. We're going to get you the help you need. You know, they say that you have anxiety disorder. It doesn't mean anything. We all know you're a great kid, blah, blah, blah. The problem was that we had the support from the therapists and the clinical people, but the school district was the problem. How so? Because they did not, this director of special ed actually said to me, she doesn't understand anxiety, which how can you be a director of special ed? Because special education isn't just, you know, kids have learning differences or other issues. It's kids with emotional disabilities, mental health issues. So that was weird. And um, I don't know why they fought me. They, they, Matt had so much documentation, seen experts, you know. Um, diagnosed with anxiety disorder. He wasn't able to do his schoolwork. He was missing school. And they still said that he didn't qualify for what's called an individualized education plan, which is to allow for services, um, accommodations and modifications, which is important to help kids with this because they might need their homework modified. They definitely need their um, attendance uh, modified and maybe have co-op classes when they are in school, which means there are two educators in the classroom. So the second can help the kids who need extra help. But they wrote in the what happens, parents ask, you don't know this unless you're you know, educated about your rights. Uh, for um, your, There's a right, it's called there, uh, you have, every child in America has a right to a free and appropriate public education, regardless of their disability. Emotional, mental health and learning differences are disabilities. So, but schools don't always treat emotional disabilities as a disability because it's, it's not seen. So schools are supposed to give 
do whatever I can to help that child access their education. So say my son was overwhelmed with schoolwork, in theory, they should say, okay, M Matt doesn't need to do 20 questions on his homework. Let him do five. Matt doesn't have to, let's make alternative um, uh, accommodations for him. Instead of um, presenting from the class, he can present to the teacher. So things like that are in an IEP. And they wrote to me, so I asked to be evaluated. That's you get a psychological and educational evaluation. The school has the ability to say, okay, we are going to evaluate your child or you don't qualify for that. So the first time around, my, they said my son didn't qualify. And this was after he was admitted to an acute inpatient hospitalization because he wasn't leaving his room at one point and he wasn't, you know, really eating. He wasn't bathing. He wasn't really, you know, living. So we brought him to an acute hospitalization. And, you know, when you walk, you don't think your child's going to go in, into an inpatient mental health facility. But so when we went to the school, the caseworker actually wrote, that him going to an inpatient mental health facility was a one-off, meaning that it doesn't really mean anything. Forget that. It happened once. You know, it's not a big deal. <laughs> so I will never forget that word, a one-off. Like, what the hey? A kid who's been admitted to an inpatient hospitalization is a one-off? I mean, you know, even kids who have um, threatened to hurt themselves or tried to hurt themselves don't always get an IEP because school districts misinterpret the law because they don't understand it or intentionally because they don't have the resources or they don't have the time or the staff. So in order to have success, all the research shows and real life that in order to get your child back to school, you really need collaboration from the school and the parent. So if I started educating families on school avoidance and what was happening was they knew everything to do, but the schools you know, they kept hitting a roadblock with the schools because they didn't get it. So that's why we developed our professional development for educators. So now they are educated and the parent, so, you know, best worlds, you know, they can make, meet and collaborate. If the parent, if the school does not understand school avoidance or feels the child's manipulating or feels that the child's bad or the parent is to blame, they're never going to make any progress with this child. And unfortunately, that's what's happening in most of America. So a lot like the parents in my Facebook group, my peer support group, you know, they're a lot of them are at the verge of an emotional breakdown because the parent they're being blamed by the school district and threatened with truancy, fines. So it really is an S show out there. And that's why it's so heartbreaking and so important to share this make parents aware and make educators aware that there is professional development out there and school avoidance is real. And when you meet a family or a child, you know, work with them and make sure that your staff is educated on it. So you can use the right interventions and not try to institute punitive practices, which just are, you know, gonna may they make matters worse. I want to go to you, Frank, and I want to ask you a question from the psychologist's point of view. Okay. So if you're a parent and you're dealing with something like this or something that's close to it and you know we're, we're basically talking about a mental health issue more than really you know anything anxiety probably falls underneath that umbrella what's certain language that we can use with our kids what's certain language that we can use with our educators to help them understand the severity of the situation because i mean you nailed it jane like when because we can't see these things we tend to believe they're not there and then, so that's one piece of it. But then the other thing is like, some people just don't know what they don't know. And so we have to educate them. We have to teach them. So Frank, I'm bringing you in to give us appropriate language. What kinds of things should we be saying to our to our kids? What kinds of things should we be saying to educators? And maybe you can just pick one of those. I don't know if you need to necessarily feed into the kid thing, but I think specifically educators, what do they need to hear to understand that there is a severe situation here? Um. God, I feel like there's so many layers to that. I know it's a big question. I'm <laughs> sorry, man. <laughs> um, you know, I I come back to to one of the things that uh, Jane gave us before. You asked the question before about what are the things that are detrimental. Like, what should we not do? 
Um, and I'm pretty sure one of the answers was like, ignore it, right? Like that is, that is not going to move us forward. Um, so I imagine some communication around the idea that like, you know, speaking, I guess, as the parent, regardless of who they're speaking to, some communication of, I don't see this getting better on its own. I think we need to intervene. We need to do something here. Um, I think I think that's the start, right? Just kind of voicing those words that we're we're not in a in a wait and see kind of a, a pattern anymore. That we've kind of gone beyond that, right? We're not we're no longer tracking the storm to see if it's going to come. Like the storm is the storm is here or the storm is coming. Like what do we need to do now to prepare for that? Um, I imagine that's that's one of the first things to kind of switch us from, you know, just kind of gathering information about what the situation is and really taking action into we need to do something. We're not we're not just waiting and seeing anymore. What was your experience, Jane? How did you finally get their attention? I hate to say this. Well, first of all, I brought it in. I had to hire an educational advocate. So that's someone who understands educational and disability law to be my advocate, to go to my meeting with the school to explain to them, hey, this kid qualifies. A 504 plan is a first um, uh, accommodation or resource that schools have to help a kid with accommodations and modifications. And um, that um, educational advocate I brought in got so fed up with the school because they were so hard headed and not open to listening that they got in a fight and they had to walk out, not a fist fight, but like voices were raised. Yeah. And at that point I knew Shh, this is going nowhere. And I had to hire an attorney. I had to hire a special education attorney because they were gaslighting me and my son and not doing what they should have been doing from the get go. So it took four years. I didn't get an IEP until I hired an attorney and all, um, they wanted to fight me every bit of the way. Now this happens a lot because schools have attorneys on retainer at the ready if they need to fight situations like mine. So there's something called out of um, district placements where a lot of you know the, the education model just stinks these days in America. It's outdated. It's it is. so outdated. Exactly. So it, it is like sticking, you know, a, a square peg in a round hole. I really believe that every day I feel it more and more that, you know, I don't know how to solve the education problem, but it needs to be overhauled. And um, a lot of kids would do much better in different environments. And there are a lot of different school options coming out. And that is called an out of district placement that the school district has to pay for if they, the school can't help you access your education because of your disability. So schools, most of them will fight tooth and nail to not have to pay that because an out of district placement could be $10,000 to $100,000 a year, depending on what kind of school or program it is. Now, I'm not saying every school doesn't do this. Some schools really are progressive and will give kids an added district placement who really need it. It really depends on the leadership of the school, you know, who sets the precedent of what we're going to do and how we're going to help these kids. Interesting. Did you ever consider switching schools, trying a different model, trying, you know, a charter or a private or I don't know, Montessori, or did you go through that whole rigmarole? Well, what happened was, um, like, I know at one point, uh, one or two of the mental health professionals said that um, Matt's going to probably have to end up going to a boarding school because he his room became a cocoon, a haven for him. And he, the kid really thrives in structure. And luckily, we knew that because he went to sleepaway camp every summer since he was six years old, where he was eight weeks away from us and thrived in that structured environment. So we knew that he would be fine, you know, away. But who, what mother wants to give their kid up and leave, have them leave the home? So I was told that. And I knew that that might be uh, coming. I did look at other schools, local um, private schools, but none of them, it wasn't going to solve his problem 
of getting to school. I don't think I could have gotten him to any school. We tried other schools and we had uh, interviews with them and it just didn't seem like they also were equipped to handle this. No, it's it's th this is a newer technology. I don't think ten years ago or fifteen or twenty years ago, to your point earlier, we were talking about school avoidance. You know, yeah. we didn't we didn't really have a label for it, and and you know, it, it, I don't been around though for years. There it has been labeled according to the research since nineteen thirty two. Holy smokes! <laughs> this host has no idea what he's talking about. Ignore here everything I've said to this point. <laughs> so it has been there on the periphery. So before COVID, I you know I was raising my voice. You know this is a growing crisis because it was growing before COVID, and no one really paid attention until after COVID because then it became more in the school's face. They couldn't ignore it. A lot of the kids probably had school avoidance before that were labeled as such or known as such because there was no word for it or understanding of it okay i want to encourage folks to jump over to her website which is schoolavoidancealliance.org oh. there's a lot of resource yeah there... schoolavoidance.org sorry yeah yeah it, oh is that what it is schoolavoidance.org yeah Okay, schoolavoidance.org, there's a ton of resources on there. And as we kind of wind down our conversation here over the next 10, 15 minutes, uh, I, I want to focus on, all right, what's next? Like if I'm in this position, freaking help me out. What's next? Because that's what people want. They want a solution to their issues. And so you talk about educating people on an acronym called FAPE, FAPE. Uh, and then you talk also about reintegration exposure and getting them kind of reintegrated back into it. And then you talk about school empathy. And I'm imagining that's a huge piece of what you hope to teach these educators in your personal development courses. So let's start with the acronym. Uh, FAPE is, is an acronym free for what? A free and appropriate public education. And that is part of what's called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Okay. And that states that every child, I think it was enacted in 1975, is assured a free, appropriate public education regardless of the disability. Okay. So therefore, schools are supposed to pay for another school district or school if they can't help the child access their education. But there is a huge problem because, again, schools are overwhelmed, understaffed, underfunded, and they are scared, most, a lot of them, if they hear out-of-district placement. My son's school... I'll tell you, it cost, he went to a therapeutic boarding school first. He went to a treatment program. He went to a 45-day treatment program for anxiety and school avoidance in Wisconsin. Rogers Behavioral Health, I'll give them a plug because they did a great job, wonderful people. And then after that, the um, recommendation was for him to go to a therapeutic boarding school. The therapeutic boarding school cost $110,000. And that was a key. year? Yeah, that would be really <laughs> so. This is the money that schools are. I don't blame them, they're scared, right? That. Okay, and the school district, I'm just gonna say it. I really, I really don't talk about this, but because I had an attorney and because it was back in the day, they paid for a lot of it. I had to pay for the uh, residential piece and the therapeutic piece, but they paid for the educational piece. Got it. Uh, so. That's a bit, that's scary. And then also a non-therapeutic boarding school, which my son did go to after, it was like $56,000 a year. Now they only paid for a piece, but um, yeah. So those are the numbers. <sighs> so that's, you that's understand. incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. Okay, let's talk about reintegration. And Frank, yeah. I'd love for you to listen real close. And I feel like you'll have a good follow-up question to this. All mm right. -hmm. So um, first line treatment for school avoidance is cognitive behavioral therapy with including exposure therapy. Exposure therapy is part of cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure therapy pretty much says that we're going to work on a fear hierarchy to reintegrate and reacclimate a child to school. Feel, you know, assuming that being in school for a full day is the top of the fear hierarchy and then start at the bottom, the least fearful situations. And this is exposure therapy usually is done and should be done with a mental health professional. The problem is because there's a shortage of mental health professionals, we're kind of asking school districts to use that model. I don't know if it's fair, but right now it's all that we have. 
um, and to start the child's exposures, meeting them at their present level of functioning, which is each kid is different. Some kids are won't leave their bedroom. So their first step of exposure might be even coming downstairs in their home. Their second exposure, you know, might be leaving the house. They might have an exposure where, you know, they have social anxiety to, you know, call someone on the phone, like a relative. I mean, these are things, a lot of the um, exposure therapy that people have heard about says the first exposure should be touching the door handle in the school. Um, I kind of laugh at that now. I know it's what I was told and I know it's mean of me to laugh at it because maybe that is the first exposure. But for most of the families that I speak to, touching the door handle does nothing, means nothing. Um, maybe it works for someone. So please forgive me for that. But it really has to be realistic pieces to build that child's confidence. And the thought behind it is that after a child is exposed to, say, leaving the house, you keep doing it until the child is doing it and is comfortable in that, that anxiety. It might take, you know, one time, it might take 10 times. Uh, I think it's called like uh, extinction, exti extin ex extinction, like getting rid of that fear, habituation, it, letting it become like a habit of the child that they can get over that level of fear and move to the next level. So, I, you know, I have all this on my website and uh, our courses for our parents and our schools. And um, it's time consuming and schools and parents get frustrated. It takes time. The problem that's happening out there, unfortunately, is schools here, uh, reintegrating kid. So the school district will say, OK, Sam will come to school on Monday for one hour. On Wednesday, he'll come for two hours. On Friday, he'll come for three. And next week, he'll come for a full day. Well, that's their schedule. It's not reintegrating a kid based on their fear. It has nothing. It's not individualized. It's, it's kind of a demand. So that happens a lot where the school will say, well, Sam must come to school on Monday or we're going to unenroll him. That happens too. Kids are being unenrolled. So I'll, I'll, I'll let Dr. Frank talk. Yeah, talk <laughs> about that, that whole idea of reintegration, man. Well, I want to I wanna tie it back into one of the first things that we talked about at the top, that there's a large portion of kids who don't understand, can't articulate why or where this comes from, right? So we have, you know, the, the idea of reintegration, the idea of exposure therapy, like, so there, there's at least one potential treatment path, we can call it that, uh, to, you know, getting on the other side of this. Is it necessary for those kids who, who don't know where it comes from, can't articulate where it comes from, can't pinpoint where it comes from? Is that a precursor to any of this? Do we have to figure out or help that kid figure out where that comes from? Or does that not matter? Can we just, can we identify the treatment and start, you know, working on, on the, the solution? Well, um, there's something called the school refusal assessment scale, and that um, is a assessment that was created by uh, Dr. Chris Carney out of the University of Las Vegas, and this is specific for school avoidance. So it's an assessment that the child takes and the parent takes, and then they divvy up the score. The um, score, and what it's supposed to tell you is. Um, was the child, is the child avoiding school for um, avoidance, avoiding social evaluative situations, or maybe avoiding um, situations like um, academics that they're fearful of or feel, feel discomfort about or, or scared of? Or are they pursuing tangible rewards, which is like separation anxiety where they want to be with the parent? Or is it full on, you know, I just want to hang out and, you know, sleep and play, um, you know, online? And the school refusal assessment scale is useful at the very beginning stages. It's not really as useful as you get into it because what happens is the um, avoidance might turn, uh, the negative avoidance, avoiding school might turn into also having positive gains because the child is gaining positive rewards from being at home, you know, just that, that safety, you know, the avoiding the fear, that itself is a tangible reward. So it's not bulletproof in any which way, but it's helpful at the beginning 
And therefore, schools can try to tailor their or parents their reintegration based on that. Obviously, if you know what's going on, of course, the diagnosis would be a very helpful. But sometimes just from their behaviors, you can tell where where they are. Mm-hmm. You know, there are some kids who can't do homework. Maybe they can leave their house, but they can't even do schoolwork. So maybe, you know, the first exposure would be, you know, just doing any kind of work that's fun. You know, I'm, I'm just throwing this out of my hat. I'm not a clinical, I'm not a therapist, but, and then, you know, working towards doing academics. So it just, I guess the behavior can show you where to start as well. Mm-hmm. I'm really just guessing here because I'm not an expert. So I don't want to say anything. Here. We have one here. Frank, go. <laughs> I love that. <Dr. laughs> it's all on um, you. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, I was kind of expecting the answer that you gave. Like, I think inherently we like to know reasons for things. We like to know why stuff happens. Um, and in a lot of cases, there can be any kind of event that happens in the world that may not have a a true explanation or, or we aren't privy to it. Uh, and we like to create one in our head, whether we're right or wrong, um, because it, it feels more comforting to know why something oh, happened. Please. Um, but I, in, in a lot of cases, it matters less how we ended up here. And it matters more. What are the things that we know works to kind of get us back to where we want to get to. Um, so I think a lot of times people might get caught up on the on the why you know how can we possibly fix it if we don't know why and if if that's a a script that's in your head um that's probably going to keep you stuck a little bit longer than you need to be Mm -hmm. uh and and besides reintegration and uh, what really helps successful outcomes is for the school to understand and acknowledge it's a real thing and not blame the parent and have empathy for the parent understand what the family might be going through because they don't see the breakdown of the family. It's really hard to see your kids struggling, crying or not leaving their bedroom. It's scary, really mm-hmm. scary. And it's hard for an educator sometimes to put themselves in parents' shoes. So that factor of understanding is so important. And we have parents who have kids who have um, gone back to school. And whenever that happens, we say, okay, well, where's the magic? And it always, always um, contains a school that was empathetic, spoke to their mental health professionals, and worked collaboratively, collaboratively with the family and didn't blame and was patient. Those are success. success. Kind of yeah. sounds like how you solve every problem ever. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> And and not to diminish that we're talking about something very specific here, but like how good of advice is that for pretty much everything? Yeah. (laughs) That's so true. Yeah, it is. Is there a balance? And maybe as I start to kind of wrap up here, is there a balance? I want to explain where I'm coming from, from this. So like I'm a youth uh, sports coach. I, I coach high school kids and I think everybody nowadays is where most of us progressive people, at least that understand that we need, it's time for change. We're trying to strike a balance of, yeah, you got to be there for every practice and every game, but if you're going through something like it might be okay that you just miss a month and we're trying to navigate that space and, and find that good chewy center. Right. And because the pair it's, it's shifted a little bit. And so when you when I say that, what do you think about? It? I can see you smile there, and I can I can feel like yeah, that that is something. So, what do you think about as I say? How do we navigate that new space to find that new chewy center, and what's going to work here? Well, first of all, I have to say, wow, that is awesome. That as a coach, you would even think about that yeah. because I think that you know our assumption and our stereotype of coaches is all about win and just showing up. So to hear you say that is quite miraculous in itself that you are aware of that. And I think that, you know, it's really important for parents to know that you care about their kids, because I bet you, I had this with my kid. He did rec sports. He was not an athlete, but he did it because everyone else did it. And he had crying fits before he went to practice sometimes. Like, like he did not want to go. And it was like hell, you know, it was horrible. And, you know, 
maybe one time we forced him or made him, but the rest, I couldn't get him to, it wasn't worth it. I was like, he wasn't going to be a baseball player. But then you're like, okay, you, am I reinforcing negative behavior? It's really, you know, a fine line. I'd ask Dr. Frank to answer that. But I think it's wonderful that you would say that. And it's just amazing to let parents know that you understand that things happen and that kids have a lot on their plate and parents. And if they have to miss something, that they're not going to be penalized for it. Right. I, I'm assuming right. if they want to be on the team, that they really want to be there. Yeah, for certainly. Like, so, and, and we've right. just had a few cases this year where kids have gone through some pretty serious things. And my opinion is, if you need to be away from this for a couple of few weeks, we're ready for you when you come back. And that, because that's a much, like, I know I'm going to get to my end goal, which is a healthy, happy athlete, much faster that way if I just let them go through what they need to go through rather than like, force them to be in all these places that are going to be uncomfortable for them. Well, I just love that you said that. It makes me think about all the, the people who can be doing that. Yeah, well, for sure. Frank told me to blog it, so I owe it all that. to him. You can write a blog on that. I, I will. I will. I've actually done several podcasts. There's a lot of um, sports psychologists that we've had on this podcast before who are talking about shifting that paradigm. And wow, I love that. Really moving the needle there with how we treat sport and – uh, yeah, I would encourage anybody listening to this to go back and listen to the one that we did with uh, Scott Lancaster, who made the powerful statement that as much as sports does to improve the lives of young people, he projects that it hurts just as many. And uh, just even thinking about youth sports that way can oftentimes make people go, hmm, what's happening here? So I see that. I see that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, Frank, you, you got the last word here how do we navigate this new Chewy Center for everybody, right? Because you have this old school mentality, which is he's like, go do, go do. And this new school, which is, hey, can we freaking hold on a second and get our head around this thing and then figure out a plan? Yeah. How do we melt these two worlds? And basically you'll be solving peace across the world with this answer. Cool. So no pressure. All right. Well, there's uh, there's two things to that. Number okay, one, here we go. I'm, I'm writing them I'm, down. I'm going to try to not forget them both. Uh, number one, uh, I think for some, like, I think back to when I was a kid, if there was, we'll, we'll put under the umbrella of like stuff that I was going through school related or family related or friend related or whatever, sport was kind of the safe haven for me. It was the place that made me happier and better and a place where I could kind of forget about whatever was bothering me outside of that. So for me, it was better to keep doing those things. Um, for some kids, I imagine if the thing that they're dealing with, you know, if we're talking about school avoidance, we're talking about um, that that fear of evaluation and failure and that kind of thing. We're also pushing them to sport where they're constantly going to be up against, you know, evaluation and failure and whatever. Um, so that that's kind of pouring salt into it. So I think kind of assessing what's going on and how it relates to or, or kind of evaluating how sport fits into that that kid's life. Um, because I think for some people, they need that. They still need that outlet. I needed that outlet. Um, and for some people, pushing them into that thing makes things worse. I'll pause there. Does that make sense? It does to me. Yeah. And it boils down to communication, right? Between the parents and, and the coaches. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that we lack a little bit is the ability to communicate. Like, how do you go to your coach and say, I need a few weeks off? You yeah. literally just call your coach and you say, I need a few <laughs> weeks off. And that's, that's, that's how that should work. Well, and I, I mean, I would sum it up in terms of making that decision with the kid. Like, is the kid better off for having gone, right? Are they happier during that hour or two hour practice? Even if they're then like sad or frustrated or whatever afterwards, if it's not because of the practice, it's just because, the distraction of practice isn't there anymore, right? Then then you keep going to practice because practice is a positive thing mm -hmm. for that kid. Um, if it's just, if it just adds one more thing that they have to worry about right now and it makes things worse, then you stop doing it, right? Do things that make you better. Don't do things that make you worse. So we can kind of sum it up that way. Um, the other piece to what you said of, how, you know, how do we balance like go, go, go with, uh, you know, maybe I need a break right now. Uh, even with going to school, you know, balancing, well, you're, you're feeling some kind of way, we're going to force you to go to school anyway, as opposed to maybe there's something we actually need to step back and evaluate here. Um, that is one of the things that I have thought, and I'll, I'll kind of share personally, 
it is one of the things that I think is going to be hardest to teach my kid or kids uh, down the road. Emotions exist for a reason. They give us information, right? Feeling fear is actually good and healthy, right? I should be fearful of running across a highway because odds are I'm not great at Frogger and I'm not going to make it to the other side, right? There, I, I should be fearful of that because it is a dangerous situation and I probably shouldn't do it. But there are also a ton of times in your life where you feel fear and you're supposed to do the thing anyway, right? I think back to like when I was in plays as a, a kid in high school or like there is a, a fear that comes right before you step out on stage. But that doesn't mean in that case that you're not supposed to do it. You're yeah. you're still supposed to do it. So just because something makes you anxious or, or fearful or whatever, like that doesn't always mean you're supposed to stop doing it. Sometimes it means you actually do it anyway, and that's better for you. Mm -hmm. But teaching somebody else when to decide to push through the fear and ignore the fear seems really hard to do. <laughs> and I have a couple of years to start figuring that out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that I think that becomes the thing. What's that? I never even thought about that piece right there, that division of, you know, where what is the line and how do you help someyone recognize that? I never even thought about that. Wow. Because th powerful. like <laughs> there's almost anything that is accomplished at a high level, like there is there is a fear of failure that mm -hmm. that is associated with that, right? Like I don't I don't want to apply to my dream college because I don't want to get rejected from them. So maybe I just won't apply. Like, no, that's a perfect example of we do it anyway. And we have to learn with how to be okay with what happens if it doesn't turn out the way that we would want. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's so many intricacies around, you know, fear, avoidance, anxiety, all of those things where sometimes you're supposed to step back and sometimes you're supposed to keep going. And it's really freaking hard to decide sometimes which one is which. Final thoughts from you, Jane, after all of that. I was just going to add one more thing, like cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, talks often about your automatic negative thoughts and they're not always right. That's kind of the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy. Your thoughts and feelings lead to behaviors and actions. And um, sometimes, you know, you feel like the world is watching. You feel like you're being evaluated or you're thinking people are looking at you funny, but our minds play tricks on us. What we perceive and think is going on is not always the truth so that i just want to say like i love cognitive behavioral therapy i had it i went through it myself and it helped me immensely i really i believe they should be teaching it in schools mm -hmm. because it's a thousand it, percent it, we all have no, um, automatic thoughts and we're talking mm -hmm. to ourselves throughout the day we should learn how to deal with them <laughs> sorry i had to yeah. get that in no, yeah. that's great. Well, I really sincerely thank you, Jane, for coming on and helping us understand more about this avoidance issue. And for the people that are going through it, it's it's just critical. They know they're not alone, They know, that they understand that there's resources out there. And we've mentioned your site several times in this thank podcast, you. but if you want to uh, hit that, it'll be in our show notes and we'll link people right to it. And if you're an educator listening to us right now and this is something that you've started to see in your own classrooms, because I would imagine, like everything, COVID has amplified this situation for yes. so many people, and you want to do more to get educated. Um, Jane mentioned that she does have some personal development available for educators, and so it's like the old NBC commercials. Remember those PSAs? The more you know, the more you the know. More you know the better off you are. And so we encourage everybody to step into that uh, mm -hmm. that lane of education just so you can understand it more and then be better ultimately that's what we're here to do be better for those kids that we're serving every single day yeah nice yeah jane thanks again dr frank bavacqua thank you for your insights too good to be here all right take care everybody we'll see you next time bye we have three goals with learn from people who lived it one to help you feel less alone two encourage you to seek out a coach a therapist, a church, anyone who can help you get through your journey.
and find some healing. Three, when you're ready, share your story with us. Find Learn From People Who Lived It, wherever you get podcasts. Search it using all one word, Learn From People Who Lived It. You've probably heard me say this before, but most of the things that kill us are preventable. And that's exactly why I put my heart in his hands, in his care. I'm talking about Dr. Robert Todd Hurst and Health Span MD. He's my cardiologist because I appreciate his holistic approach to heart health. There's nothing out there like Health Span MD. His AFib reversal program, his CAD reversal program. Get the link on the resources page at learnfrompeoplewholivedit.com.